Welcome everyone to BIS 103 Lecture 5. In this part of the lecture, what I want to focus on is how we can further break down pyruvate, our product of glycolysis. And so as a learning goal for this part of the lecture, at the end of it, we should be able to explain the catabolism, so the breakdown of pyruvate by pyruvate decarboxylase. We use this for comparison and specifically the pyruvate dehydrogenase. We want to understand the fundamentals of the mechanism as well as the cofactors that we're using in this reaction. It's a really important reaction in metabolism because it provides a link between the product of glycolysis and the downstream reactions of energy production. So we already had talked about fermentation in the last lecture, right? We had talked about what happens to pyruvate of a glycolytic product in the case oxygen is absent. So we had talked about ethanolic fermentation and lactate fermentation specifically, but we hadn't really talked about what is actually happening in the presence of oxygen. All I had showed you at this point was that we had this cofactor problem and we had to resolve it using a number of cellular processes, a number of carriers, and eventually the electron transport chain. So fairly vague. Today, we want to start looking into what actually is happening to pyruvate in the presence of oxygen. How can we further utilize this compound to generate ATP? And so the key player in this is the PDH or the pyruvate dehydrogenase. It's a key enzyme. It's actually an enzyme complex, as we will see. What it does is it takes pyruvate here and it converts it into acetyl-CoA, one of the key intermediates, as we will see, in energy metabolism. It's a quite complex reaction. As you can already see here, we're doing a decarboxylation. We're using NAD, so it looks like we're also going to do an oxidation. So we'll see how this works. Important to note here, this is the reaction that will occur if oxygen is present. So we're not doing fermentation here, we're going a different route in the presence of oxygen. But you can compare to what we learned in fermentation, right? If you remember our alcoholic or ethanolic fermentation, we had a very similar decarboxylation happening. We said though, right, animals don't have this enzyme, so we don't have it. But the pyruvate decarboxylase, the first step in ethanolic fermentation from pyruvate, decarboxylated to acid aldehyde, or originated already there, and they're actually mechanistically very related. But if we go one slide back, here our product is acetyl-CoA and not acid aldehyde. So while these two enzymes are mechanistically related and function in a similar way, the dehydrogenase reaction is actually more extensive, coming to a different product. So in order to understand our PDH reaction, we have to do a small excursion, and actually talk about how decarboxylation reactions function in general. Right? In general, compounds that can be de decarboxylated fall into three types of compounds, and I listed them up here. These are the beta keto acids, beta hydroxy acids, or alpha keto acids. Only those three types of compounds can be decarboxylated with the enzyme portfolio that we have. But how does it work? So I'm starting on the right here with the beta keto acids. Right? How can these be decarboxylated? Right? The carboxy group that we want to remove as carbon dioxide is sitting right here. If you want to decarboxylate this, what we need is a carbon-carbon cleavage reaction. Right? We had seen this already in our priming phase in glycolysis, where we did a carbon-carbon cleavage reaction. But we split the molecule in half into two three-carbon molecules. Right? Here, it's slightly different. We are working with very similar principles, but we only want to remove the carboxy group. What we need then is that we have to have a keto function right here, right? A ketone, our carbonyl group right here, in the beta position to your functional group. Right? Here's your functional group, your carboxy group. Here's alpha carbon, here's the beta carbon. It needs to have a keto function here. In this case, it's a beta keto acid that can be decarboxylated. The principles for the carbon-carbon cleavage, again, are the same. We have this carbonyl group that is drawing electrons. It is causing a delocalization 
of electrons along the molecule, weakening this bond here in order to decarboxylate. But what I really want you to remember is just how you can identify whether or not a compound can be decarboxylated based on this alpha beta carbon rule. The other group that can be decarboxylated is our beta hydroxy acids. Right? The only difference here now is that we don't have a keto function at the beta carbon right here. We have a hydroxy group. Right? We don't have the keto function yet, but beta hydroxy acids can easily be oxidized into a beta keto acid. And so with just this additional step, they also can be decarboxylated. So while we need an additional reaction in this particular case, we still consider beta hydroxy acids as part of the groups that can be decarboxylated. Very important to note, written down here, no cofactor is required to do this. This actually happens spontaneously in this concentration. An enzyme can do this. Okay. That leaves us with the third group up here, the alpha keto acids. So they work a little bit differently. The rule is the same, right? You have your functional group. You want to count down your carbons, alpha carbon, beta carbon. In this case, we have our keto group in the alpha carbon position. So we have an alpha keto acid. Okay. This can also be decarboxylated, but in this case, we need a cofactor. We need thiamine pyrophosphate or TPP. Right? I mentioned TPP already when we talked about um, ethanolic fermentation today. We will actually look at how it works as part of the PDH reaction. And you can also see some of the structural insights on this cofactor in our small supplemental video as part of this lecture on cofactors. Okay. So this is the other group, the alpha keto acids. Important here now is that pyruvate, right? We want to talk about pyruvate catabolism today is an alpha keto acid. So here we go. This is our PDH reaction now. We have pyruvate here. We want to decarboxylate and we want to generate acetyl-CoA. Right. So you already know now how we can do it based on it being an alpha keto acid mechanistically. Because we actually want to add this cofactor here, we actually need a number of cofactors. So in addition to NAD for the oxidation and in addition to TPP, as I mentioned already, we need another cofactor, CoA, another one, lipoic acid or lipoamide, and another one, FAD or flavin adenine dinucleotide. I will show you in this video how these cofactors work as part of PDH in the reaction. Again, in the small supplemental video, you can see some information on their structure, on how they function in general. Let's go into the mechanism of PDH. It is a complicated mechanism. I really do not expect you to understand all the movements of electrons and hydrates that are occurring here. If you understand the general mechanism, the way I explain it and to the level that I explain it here, this will be fully sufficient. So what do we want to do, right? Again, we want to convert pyruvate into aldehyde first. This was the part of our um, PDC reaction, the pyruvate decarboxylate and ethanolic fermentation. This part of the reaction mechanism is actually identical between the PDC and the PDH. So what is happening here? We're bringing in pyruvate, that's right here, that's your substrate, and we're bringing in our first cofactor, the TPP. The business end of TPP is sitting right here. This carbon here, because it is sitting next to this partially positively charged nitrogen, actually will act very weakly to this bond. And this proton here can be very easily lost. If that happens, you're actually generating a carbanion, so negatively charged. Now, if you look at our pyruvate, right, we have our carbonyl group here. And if you remember the carbonyl groups, right, we have a positive charge on our carbon here because of the electrons drawing away to the oxygen, making this an electrophile. This carbanion is a nucleophile. We can have the corresponding reaction which means that our pyruvate will actually be bound to the TPP itself. Once this happens, you can have a whole series of electron and hydride movements that we won't go into in detail, but these essentially weaken the bond to the carboxy group here enough that we can decarboxylate. 
So it shows you why it's so important that for these alpha keto acids, we need TPP to do this. Okay. The outcome here is that we now have the decarboxylated form of pyruvate acid aldehyde here, still in its bound form to the cofactor. In the pyruvate decarboxylase in ethanolic fermentation, all that would happen now is that we would release acid aldehyde as a product and the reaction would end there. We want to go further, right? So there's more to this reaction in the PDH reaction because we want to make acid acetyl-CoA, not acid aldehyde. So how does this work? So here's just where we stood, right? Our TPP bound to the acid aldehyde functional group. Now, how do we get our CoA onto this? There are a number of steps. The first step is that we're actually handing over the um, acid aldehyde function to another cofactor here, lipoamide. And lipoamide's business end is here, this does sulfide bond, which can be reduced and then it can be opened to two sulfhydro groups. These are very reactive and they can now take over the acid aldehyde group from TPP. Now we have the acid aldehyde group here on lipoamide and TPP is being released again as a carb anine and it's ready to do its job to take on another pyruvate substrate. Now we have it here on the lipoamide. Here's our intermediate. We want to get it onto CoA, our next cofactor, coenzyme A here. So it's coming in. It also has the sulfhydryl group. It's a thioester. This is actually a high energy compound. So A, it's hydrolysis can release a lot of energy and it's very good functional group to facilitate other reactions. So this now can take over the acid aldehyde group, the acetyl group of this part here on, and we can add our CoA chain to acetyl, we generated acetyl CoA. This will now be released from the PDH as its product. Right. Now one issue is we have a cofactor problem, right? In this process, what we've done, we have released lipoamide here in its reduced form. But as you see up here, the activated form to facilitate this reaction has a disulfide bond. So what we have to do here, even though we now have made our product, we should be happy. We have to deal with our cofactor problem. We have to reoxidize lipoamide. How do we do this? We're actually bringing in two more cofactors. The first one here being FAD, flavin adenine dinucleotide, in its oxidized form. This will take on the electrons from these two sulfhydryl groups. It will be reduced in the process to FADH2, but we're regenerating lipoamide in its oxidized form. We can now do another round of these reactions. In order to regenerate our oxidized FAD now, we are taking our good old friend NAD in its oxidized form. It will take over the electrons from FADH as well as the hydrides. We are generating NADH and H+. And that, much like we have seen for glycolysis, can be regenerated through a number of different um, cellular processes. In this case here, it will not be fermentation. Just to be clear, right? we are discussing here conditions in the presence of oxygen. So fermentation only happens in the absence of oxygen. So fermentation is not a player here, but other cellular processes are, and we'll see um, ongoingly throughout the lectures which these are. So it's a complicated mechanism. I just show it here in the complex. So PDH is actually a complex of individual enzyme functions. So just here in this cartoon, we have our substrate pyruvate come in. It is bound to TPP, decarboxylated in its bound form to TPP. Now we have this acetyl function left from pyruvate right here. We're handing it over to lipoamide. Now it's sitting right here. Lipoamide will hand it over to our cofactor CoA that now is attached to our acetyl um, side chain. We are forming acetyl CoA, our product. And now we have a reduced lipoamide cofactor, not bound to the intermediate anymore. We're using FID to regenerate it, to reoxidize it, and we're reoxidizing FID for its continued function using NAD. So this is PDH, one of the key reactors in energy metabolism. What we have done in this really complex mechanism is convert pyruvate coming out of glycolysis into acetyl-CoA. And acetyl-CoA now 
will move further in energy metabolism and we'll discuss this and how it works in the next lectures.